Um, but we are in kind of the full swing of summer, and Casey started us off last week on our summer series called AC Epic Road Trip. AC Epic Road Trip. And the reason why we're calling it a road trip is because we're kind of using a map, um, and we're using the book of Hebrews as our road map. And Hebrews 11, um, it, it goes through and it kind of gives a quick summary of a lot of stuff that happened in the Old Testament. And it goes through some of the, you know, quote, heroes of the faith and kind of what they did. And so it's kind of an abbreviated version. So we're going to use Hebrews 11 as our map and kind of jump back a little bit and go through some of the Old Testament. And Casey started us off last week and he talked about how um, the, kind of the theme in that passage is faith. And by faith, it says, by faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Isaac did this. By faith, Jacob. So that, that element of by faith being kind of the, the activating element. And we talk a lot about uh, Vision 2020 and, and joining with Church United. And, and what we want to see is, is the amount of Christ followers, like more of that baptism, <laughs> more of that. Like that's, that's what Vision 2020 is. We want to see lost people come to know Jesus. Take the next step in obedience. And right now, 3% of people in South Florida would say that they follow Christ, would say that they're a follower of Jesus. And so what Vision 2020 is, is that we're believing that, man, by faith, by living out our faith, we, we believe and want to see that number go from 3% to 6%. And so, and so in order for that to happen, the activating element is going to be faith. And faith is a belief. Faith is a trust, a belief that leads to trust. So our passage for today in Hebrews, the part of our map, is Hebrews 11.20. And this is what it says. Very simply, it says, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. And so that, like we said, is talking about the Old Testament and that story of Jacob and Esau and that blessing happens kind of from Genesis 25 to Genesis 28. Um, and so that's where, that's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to kind of get after it. Um, but let's pray, and then we'll look at, uh, we'll spend some time in Genesis. God, we're so thankful for who you are. We're, we're thankful that... Um, when we gather, Lord, you meet us in a special way. And so that's what we ask for. Um, God, we don't ask for more biblical knowledge. We don't ask to be entertained. Lord, we ask that this morning we would meet and interact with the God who made us. Because when you do that, Lord, you, you change us. And so that's what we're asking for. Lord, thank you for the Avenue Church and for what you're doing. Thank you for those six people that we got to celebrate with yesterday. Lord, we're celebrating with them, but what we're celebrating is your work, the fact that you're on the move. And so, Lord, help us to be with you. Help us to be with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, um, man, we're talking about a road trip, and, and I cannot think of, of uh, I can't hardly say road trip without thinking of, like, one, one seriously epic road trip that we went on. Um, when I was a kid, one of my dad's his dream was always to go out west, and he had never done it, um, always wanted to take this road trip out west. And so one year, like, he just went for it. And so he bought this RV, this big, long, like, pull-behind RV, and we took, like, eight weeks, and he's like, get in the car, load the family up, we're going, I don't care, we're just going to do it. And it's definitely one of those things that, like, in the moment, I didn't realize how awesome it was and what kind of an experience that was. But looking back, it's like it was, it was like the greatest thing. So we drove from Cocoa Beach to San Francisco and back. It was pretty, it was pretty crazy. Um, and, and I don't know, I wasn't in charge of like the map. I wasn't in charge of the atlas. We're talking about the road trip and the map and all that. I don't know what it was. I don't know if we had like the, the first navigation systems that were horrible um, or if we were actually using a paper map. But what I was in charge of was this book called The Next Exit. Does anybody in this room ever know what that book is? The Next Exit. Yes, he knows what's up. This book is a, is a gold mine, okay? So my job was The Next Exit. I would sit in the back, and this book was big like an encyclopedia, um, and, and it would like, it would have every highway in the United States, and it would tell you, this was like before you could look at it on a smartphone, like what is on 
that exit. Stores, restaurants, shops, gas stations, all that. So I'm in the back, like, flying through this thing, trying to find where the closest french fries are. Like, that was my role on the road trip. I was like the chubby kid in the back seat, like, there's a McDonald's, get off, get off. Like, we're not stopping. Um, but that was, that was my thing. I wasn't in charge. Um, I wasn't in charge of the, the map, but I was in charge of the next exit. And so, like I said, we went all the way. We would, like, drive a few hours and then stop and, like, check out that area for a day and then drive a few hours. And so we get to, like, the farthest point. We get to San Francisco, <clears throat> and we're coming in, um, pulling this, like, big, long trailer, driving in our truck, and we have this plan. And our plan is that, hey, it's getting kind of late. Like, it's, you know, it's kind of the evening time. So we know this campground we're going to stay at is on, like, it's, like, up here. It's, like, north, north of the city. And we've got this big, long rig, so we're like, we'll just, we'll just kind of drive on the highway. We'll, we'll get through. We'll get to the north side set up the camper, and then the next day, we'll hop in the truck, and we'll take the truck back down into the city and, like, check out San Francisco and stuff. And, like, that's a great plan. It makes a whole lot of sense. Um, it just didn't work. <laughs> so here, here's what happened. We came across on 80, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, like, piecing this together. So we come across, and I remember because we come across, and you're, you're like, looking at the city, and you're on this bridge. And then once we, like, hit the the part of the city, like, chaos just erupts in our truck. Our plan, like, went out the window because it was like, oh, shoot, there's a left. Do we go left? Do we go right? Get the map. What do we do? I don't know. And then, like, we just took one way, and, and I remember my dad being like, it ended. Like, the highway ended. And so the best I can figure is we got off here and came up here, and, like, not a lot of times will you see the yellow just stop. <laughs> so the yellow just stops, and it's, like, disconnected, which I'm like not a city planner, but that seems like a bad plan. But anyways, so we, we're like highway, 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 and like downtown San Francisco. And we've got this like big rig and thing, things, get very, things get very quiet in the back seat. Like when you're in the back seat, you know when to ask for french fries and just when to shut up. That was a time to be quiet because it's like, we're, like there, there's panic. Streets are small, like you've seen pictures of San Francisco. It's up, it's down. And so we're, we're, like, taking corners, hitting the curb. Our camper was hitting the trolley lines. People are, like, staring at us, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, and I remember, uh, this was a family trip, right? But there were words being thrown around that were not family-appropriate words <laughs> in that truck. I'm very quiet in the back seat. But there's, there, we're on this street, and it's, like, super, super steep. And there's a stop sign at the top. And I just remember my dad being like, I'm not stopping. I can't stop. We will, we will go backwards. We will be in the bay. And so there's traffic going. And he's like, we're not stopping. We're not stopping. And we're like, what is happening? <laughs> and we just, like, thank the Lord. Like, we just, we straight up just went through a busy street with this massive rig. Um, but we made it. Like, it was okay. Uh, we, we didn't run anybody over. We, we made it out somehow, asking for directions. Uh, but that, like... That's that easy, nice plan to like just cruise through and come back, like it just didn't happen. And so the reason why I tell you this story, apart from me thinking it's just funny, um, is we all, we all make plans in our lives. We all have like certain expectations of what life should be like, of how life should go, of what relationships should be like. But a lot of times like life just doesn't go that way. It doesn't go that way. And so since we're talking about faith in the book of Hebrews, and faith being the theme, um, this morning I want to look at what is, like, let's look at faith when life doesn't go according to plan. That's kind of our, our message for this morning. Faith when life doesn't go according to plan. Because maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you're facing something that you didn't at all plan on having to face in your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job status. Maybe it's a, uh, just a burden or a struggle. Like, I don't know what it is, but, but a lot of times our plans don't go the way we would like. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're, you're like wrestling with something in your life that, that a couple years ago you never anticipated having to wrestle with. So what does it look like? And to a certain extent, we all have those situations in our life, right? Bigger, smaller. But what does it look like like that thing in your life, that difficulty, that struggle, that thing that if you could just feel like you could just take that out, then you'd be like, you could breathe. 
Like, what does it look like to address that thing by faith? Like we read in Hebrews, by faith. And I believe that God has something um, to say about that this morning. So like we said, this roadmap in Hebrews, sending us back to Genesis chapters 25 to 28. And that's a ton. That's three chapters. It's a lot of narrative. And so we're going to hit the highlights, but we're honing in on this story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. And some of you guys probably know the story of Jacob and Esau. Maybe you grew up in church. Um, it's not like a super, super famous Bible story, but it's pretty well known. Um, and maybe, maybe you have no idea who that is and you think Esau is a weird name, and it is, and that's cool too. But um, what we're going to look at is, is the fact that like, God does something kind of beneath the surface in this story. We can, we can read through it and see it a certain way, but when we unpack it, when we study it, I think God has something special to tell us. And so we're going to get after it here. So whenever we look at the Bible, whenever we pick up this, this book and, and like try to draw applications from it and try to apply it to our lives, we've got to know what's going on in the story, especially in a narrative like this. We've got to know like what happened before it, what's happening now, and, and then what comes after. Okay, and so Casey kicked us off last week talking about Abraham. And God calls Abraham to leave and to go to this new place and to follow after him by faith. And then God calls Abraham to like, in this super weird, crazy story, to, to like sacrifice his son, Isaac, by faith. And he doesn't go through with it, and that's not like what God intended, but, but he, he asked that of Abraham. And there's some really cool gospel illustrations in like, in like sacrificing a one and only son that point us straight back to Jesus. But in, in Abraham's life, God promises, a bunch of, God promises him a bunch of stuff. He promises him land. He promises him descendants that he will, that like through Abraham, through Abraham's family, that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that's talking about Jesus. That through this line, this family, there would be a savior who would bless all the nations and that's Christ. And so Isaac is this promised son of Abraham. Abraham and Sarah are super old, past the point where you have babies, um, but God gives them this like miracle baby and he's the, the, the promised, um, the child of promise. And he's blessed. He, he is the one that is kind of to carry on those promises from Abraham to Isaac. And yet also when we read the, about Isaac, he did some really dumb stuff. <laughs> It's always true when you look at people in the Old Testament, man, they make some, some bad mistakes just like us. And so here we have Isaac. He grows up. He marries this girl named Rebecca. And they're having trouble having kids. Like they, they, they can't get pregnant. And Isaac uh, prays to the Lord. And finally, Rebecca gets pregnant. And she gets pregnant with twins, Jacob and Esau. And so we're going we're gonna to look quickly at um, one verse in Genesis 25, 25, 23. Um, we're going to spend most of the time in Genesis 27, but, but this, this thing that happens in 25 is so important to understanding the story in chapter 27. Here's what it said. This is the Lord speaking to Rebekah before these boys are born. They're in the womb. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. That, that's like super important. Before these kids are even born, God promised the older will serve the younger. And that's a big deal because in that culture, the, the, usually the, the oldest, the eldest son would get all the inheritance, would get all the blessing, would get all the status. And God flips that and he says, no, my, my promise, my blessing, the one who I appoint is the younger son before he's ever born, not the older. So let's keep going. This, this verse is not going to be on the screen, but just so that we have a little bit of context for who Jacob and Esau are. Uh, verse 27 says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So fast forward, these dudes grow up. Um, Jacob is a total mama's boy, and it says that he likes dwelling in tents. 
And he just likes to stay home with mom. That's what he wants to do. Um, while, meanwhile, his older brother, Esau, is like a bro. He's a hunter. He is out in the field. He's like this hairy dude killing things and eating it. So like, he's like, a, he's the man. And so it says that Jacob, or I'm sorry, Isaac, loved Esau. He's like, that's my, that's my son, that's my boy. And Rebekah loved Jacob. They were hanging out in the tent. Okay, um, so if you have a Bible, um, we are going to go through Genesis 27 um, after kind of setting the stage, knowing what God has promised about these two sons, and then kind of seeing how their parents treated them as they grew up. So this is what it says, Genesis 27. This isn't going to be on the screen, but we're going to um, just kind of go through a chunk of the narrative and then talk about it. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, down in verse 3, go out to the field and hunt game for me. Prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. So he, he's an old man and he's saying, look, I, I have to pass on this blessing, this blessing that, that God gave to Abraham that's been passed on to me, like this, this important lineage thing that God is doing, I've got to pass it on. And so he does what? He calls Esau and says, Esau, go out into the field. Kill me some dinner. You're good at that. Cook it for me. That'll be great. Bring it to me, and then I'm going to give you my blessing. God had already appointed before this kid was even born that that blessing wasn't for him. That wasn't for him. Yet Isaac had his own plan. He had his own plan. So we go on. Verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. <clears throat> so when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat of it and bless you. So Rebekah overhears this, what Isaac and um, Esau are planning. And so she says to Jacob, <clears throat> now therefore, my son, obey, obey my voice as I command you. Here's what we're going to do, Jacob. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats that I may prepare, <coughs> excuse me, from them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. So she, she comes up with this plan. Like Isaac, or Esau is out hunting. Jacob, go get a couple goats. We'll cook them and we'll get you that blessing. We'll get you that blessing. We'll put an end to this. And this is my, this is my favorite part. This is, this is Jacob's reasoning. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. <laughs> Which I, can, I, I feel you, bro. Like some, some of us just don't have the genetics for like the sweet beards that I'm looking at out there. Some of us are smooth men, and that's okay. Don't judge me. Uh, but he said, My brother is a hairy man. I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, <clears throat> and perhaps my father will, will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him. So he's like, if, if, if I go in there and he like gives me a hug, he's going to realize like, yo, this is not Esau. This is not Esau. And so his mother says, I don't care, do it anyways, like good moms do. Um, and then she says, um, then Rebecca took the best garments of Esau. So she takes Esau's clothes and puts them on her younger son, Jacob. And they take the skins of the young goats and put them on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. That's disgusting, number one. <laughs> number two, how hairy was that dude? <laughs> like, even hairy guys in here, like, I hope you don't feel like a goat on your neck. Like, I don't know. Um, anyways, it's in the Bible, so deal with it. Um, <laughs> So uh, they prepare the food, they put the goat skin, he puts on um, his brother's clothes. So he went to his father and said, my father, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said, I am Esau, your firstborn. That's a lie. 
I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, so that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? Like, man, Esau, even for you, that was a quick kill. <laughs> How'd you do that? And, and so Jacob's already lying, so he just figures, hey, I'll just do it more. That's a good plan. He says, because the Lord your God granted me success. That he plays the God card, lies on top of lies, not where you want to be. So he says, well, God, God allowed me to bring you the goat so quickly. And then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you to know whether you really are Esau. So Jacob went near to his father who felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. It's disgusting. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau, and so he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? And Jacob said, I am. Another lie. So he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game. And then Isaac gives the blessing, thinking that he's giving it to Esau, he gives it to his younger son, Jacob. And in verse 29, which will be on the screen, it says this. Let the people, this is part of the blessing, let the people serve you and the nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. The older serve the younger, like God had already prophesied and told them. Isaac thinks that he is executing his own plan here in giving this blessing that's reserved for Jacob to Esau. He thinks that he is doing his own plan. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. See, in his mind, he did the exact opposite of what God said. See, he knew God's plan. He just liked his plan better. And I think we can probably relate to that sometimes. We know God's plan, but our plan just seems like it fits better. Our plan seems like it works better because in his view, he's got these two sons and Esau, he's the man's man. He's a leader. Like if anybody's going to take this blessing and like pass it on and become this great nation, it's Esau. It's not the kid in the tent. <laughs> it's not Jacob. It's not Jacob. And so we go on in verse 33. Finally, Esau comes back and, he, and he, he comes, Father, I brought you this food. And he's like, what are you talking about? We just did this thing. And he's like, what do you mean? So it kind of it comes out what happened. Verse 33, Isaac realizes what happens. Then Isaac trembled very violently. He said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, surely he shall be blessed. Isaac trembled very violently. Isaac had that moment where you get caught and, and you know it didn't go your way and your stomach just sinks. Like, oh no. Like that moment when you're driving too fast and you see the red and blue and you're like, oh, this is bad. Isaac has that moment. He trembled very violently. And note, but notice what he does. He doesn't try to reverse it. He doesn't try to take away the blessing. He submits to it. See, he, he knew what he was doing was going against what God had told him to do. And he realizes that, look, God, God's going to do what he's going to do. I attempted my own plan, and it didn't work. So fast forward, last part, and then we're going to um, start making some observations here. In, in uh, chapter 28... Verses 3 and 4, there's, this is a gap. Isaac has had time to process what has happened, and he goes back again to Jacob. He goes back again to Jacob. There's this, he, there's this submission. Okay, God, like, I give up. I get it. It's your way. I don't see how. I wouldn't have chose Jacob. I would have chosen Esau. But, Lord, if, if you're going to do this thing through Jacob, then you're going to do it through Jacob. And he says this to him, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave 
to Abraham. See, Isaac, like he had to surrender his plan. He had to surrender his plan. And in faith, this takes us back to Hebrews. This is why it says in faith. It's not just a story about how Isaac got tricked. To get tricked, it doesn't take any faith. But at the end of the story, he finally had to submit and in faith say, okay, God, I'm going to give my blessing to this one. In faith, I will bless Jacob. And so that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a big story. And here's what we know about the Old Testament. Like all, all, this, all this scripture in the Old Testament, it's, it's always pointing us to Jesus. It's always pointing us to the gospel. But when you read through these, when you read through these chapters, there, there's like no one person who's the hero. And you can take certain aspects of certain people's character and, and link it um, to Christ. But, but in the end, like Isaac messed up. He did it wrong. Jacob did it wrong. Isaac lies. Isaac ignores God's instructions and his blessing, and he tries to bless Esau. Jacob, who, who in that culture shouldn't have even had the blessing, he tricks Esau out of his birthright in the beginning um, of that narrative, and then he just completely lies to his dad to get his blessing. See, none of these people in this book, none of these people in this story deserved the blessing. They all screwed up. And yet, who is God in the story? Who is God? God is unchanging. God is totally in control. And exactly what God wanted to happen, that's what happened. That's what happened. See, this, this passage gives us a picture of undeserved blessing. Nobody in that story deserved it. Undeserved blessing, and that's called grace. Grace. That's called grace. See, the gospel is about a God who is willing to pour out his blessing and his love on, on men and women who don't deserve it, just like in this story. Men and women whose track record is like far from spotless. Every person in this room has made mistakes. Everybody has a story. If, like Everybody has aspects of their life that they would not want put on that screen. Every single one of us. We've said things, we've done things. We have all, like if we're reading through your life in this book, there are points where we're like, man, they didn't get it. They don't trust God. Why would they do that? Like we're just like these people. We wouldn't want our whole story up there. We're broken. We're sinful. We're selfish. And the Bible says that those things separate us from God. But like, Yet we, we just learned that God chooses to pour out his blessings on the undeserving. So if you're here and you're like, no, man, I'm not like, I'm not a church person. You don't know me. I just kind of got roped into being here. Like, I'm not, I don't do this thing. I, you don't know my life. Like, dude, welcome to the club. <laughs> like, that's every person here. None of us are good enough. None of us, like, have a relationship with God because we, we're, we earned it. That's not the way the gospel works. But what Jesus did was he paid our debt. You and I racked up a debt that we could not pay to God because of our disobedience. It separated us from God. But Jesus paid that. See, he stood in the gap. He paid off our debts. He suffered that separation from God that you and I deserve. Three days later, he overcame it. And now... Like, just like Jacob deserved none of that blessing that he lied and tricked his way to try to get. We put our faith and our trust in the fact that Christ stood in the gap and paid our debt for us, that his perfection is in our place, that we get his perfection. Man, we, we receive the blessing of God. We receive the Holy Spirit. And not only that, like, not only do we get to know God, but we're made his ambassadors. We're made his representatives. See, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. So this story is about Jesus. It's about a God who gives his love and pours out his blessing on a bunch of people who don't deserve it. So a couple observations I want to make in light of these passages. Number one, our plans can get wrecked. See, Isaac had great plans for Esau. He was going to bless him because he knew that was the best idea. 
God said the opposite, but clearly he knew what was best. And, and we're just like Isaac. Like we can see that disobedience and think, I would never. But how often do we know exactly what God would say? And we go, no, I, I just like my plan better. See, our plans can get wrecked by, by our own doing. By our own doing. See, what Isaac did was that, that got him into a situation by being disobedient to God that his plans got messed up. But that's not the only way that our plans get messed up. Like, sometimes we we're, we're, we're feel like we're following God. We're, we're, we're not like willingly living into sin. We're actually trying to follow Jesus. And yet life and, and just living in a broken world just seems to mess up our plans. You can be following after Jesus hard and then get a, a diagnosis that you did not plan on. Or, or lose a job or have a relationship fall apart. Sometimes our plans get messed up, not because we're disobedient, but just because we're in a broken world. And it can very much be a sense of like, God, what's up with this? This, this wasn't the plan. And we don't get the privilege of just like flipping the page and seeing, seeing how it all works out. See, God says that, that he's going to work everything out for our good and his glory. And by faith, we have to trust that. We don't get to turn the page to the end of our life and see how, how and what God did. We're stuck in our chapter. But we get to live by faith into the promises of God. So number one, our plans can get wrecked. Number two, God's plans are unchallenged. God's going to do exactly what God wants to do. He's sovereign. He's totally in control. And what he does is he uses our, like, even our disobedience. There's these two people in the story, Isaac and Jacob, and they both go about it wrong. They're both sinful. And what happens in the end? God, God orchestrates it to where exactly what he wanted to happen happens. That's what God does. Because like I said, we, that happens all over this book. You read through sinful, messed up people who do the wrong thing, and yet God... God leads us right to Jesus, right to the gospel. Number three, in Christ, we experience undeserved blessing, even in the midst of our wrecked plans, even in the midst. So like in, in one way or another, we're all struggling with something this morning. Maybe it's big, maybe it's small, and we feel like, man, I just need relief from that. Like if that would go away, I could have peace. But, but the gospel says that in Christ, even in the middle of a broken world and broken circumstances, we can experience those blessings. So maybe you're, maybe you're like Isaac. Maybe you know what God says and you've just decided to do your own thing. That you like your plan better. And there's good news for you that, that like it's called grace. It's the same grace that, that brought Isaac to a place of submission and faith. That when we don't deserve blessing and inheritance and status with God, that God gives it to us in Jesus. So come to him. Maybe some of you are, are, are here and, and you're, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You, you've been adopted into his family. But that thing, man, that came at you, that curveball that you weren't planning on, that you're struggling with, it just seems to be like beating you up. And to find joy in the midst of that seems like, like it sounds nice, but it won't work. And so I, I want to um, quickly read you guys or tell you guys this story of a man named um, Horatio Spafford. <laughs> maybe you guys have heard of him, maybe you haven't, but Horatio Spafford, which is a super awesome name. Um, here, here's, here's Horatio's story. He lived in Chicago in the 1860s. He had a wife named Anna and five kids. And up until this point, everything was going pretty good um, for him. He had invested pretty heavily in real estate in Chicago, and so he had a lot of properties. He had a lot of income, um, and he was doing well. In 1870, his son died of scarlet fever at four years old. So he had one son and four daughters. In 1870, his son gets sick and dies. In 1871, 
the great fire, the great Chicago fire destroyed all of his investment properties. Gone. Money, gone. All of his financial stability, gone. So he decides that, hey, I'm going to get out of Chicago for a while. All, all this like, kind of trauma has, has come to my family. We're going go to we're go to England for a little bit. And so he puts his wife and his four daughters on a ship to England. He's got to wrap up some business. And he says, I'll, I'll meet you over there. And that steamship that he put them on to England, he gets word that that ship sank. 226 people lost their lives. A few days later, he, gets, he receives word that his wife survived. But she tells him that their four daughters did not. So he decides he's going to get on the next ship and go to be with his wife, to grieve with his wife. And when he's on the journey over there, the captain calls him to the bridge and says, this is, this is the point, this is the place where that ship went down. And he wrote these words to this hymn that you've probably heard before, It Is Well With My Soul. He wrote those words. He said this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Like how? How is that well with your soul? When, when that dude's life seemed to be going so well, his, his like plans were being executed, and then just disaster after disaster. When sorrows like sea billows roll, as he's going over the place in the sea where he lost his daughters, after he's lost his son, he's lost everything. But he says, thou, thou hast taught me to say. Even in the midst of that, thou hast taught me to say. That's a man who has made a habit of going straight to Jesus of going straight to Jesus when life throws us something that we weren't expecting. See, the first step is always to the person. The first step is always to Jesus. And so as we become people who like, no matter what's happening, our plans are going great, everything, or, or it's a disaster, like we are people who the first step is always Jesus, to engage with his spirit, to meet him. See, a lot of times I think that we're like a little kid and we, we have these problems and we have these struggles and, and we just like, we focus on the mess and it's like, oh my goodness, God, how am I going to deal with this? And I wasn't expecting this and all these things. And God's saying, Jesus is saying, look at me. Like, hey, look, hey, look at me. I've got this. Come to me. I am sovereign. I'm in control of this. Come to me. But so often our first step is not to the person. Our first step is to just, well, fill in the blank. Our first step can be a lot of things that aren't Jesus. We have to set our eyes on Jesus. See, God is not surprised. You might be surprised by what you're struggling with or what you're going through. God is not surprised by what you're struggling with in your life. And guess what? He's not expecting you to be strong enough and to overcome it on your own. That's good news. He's not expecting you to overcome this on your own strength. Because when you feel, when you feel like, like, man, I don't have the faith to carry this out. I don't have the faith to do this. You're probably right. <laughs> so the first step has got to be to Jesus. Amen. Our battle plan has got to be to go first to the cross before we go anywhere else. I think, like, man, if you had to describe the way that you deal with your struggle or, or your whatever curveball kind of came your way, if you had to describe that process to somebody who's a non-believer, would they understand it? Would they relate to it? Would they say, oh yeah, like I, I do that too, like if I just had a long weekend, like, may, like, or would they be like, what are you talking about? You go, you go to Jesus. Would that make any sense to them? See, our battle plan has to be the first step to the person. The first step. See, it wasn't until Isaac was at the end of his plan that he finally found submission to God's will. And here, here's the cool part. And we'll, we'll end after this. Here's the cool part about taking that first step to Jesus is that he actually knows what it, what it feels like. Like he actually knows what that's like to have to conquer something in front of you that seems really, really big. We're going to look quickly at Matthew 26. 
verses 38 to 39. Jesus is about to be arrested. He's about to go to the cross, and he knows that. And he said to his disciples, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, he's staring at a massive, massive obstacle in front of him. And no part of Jesus' humanity like, wants to do that. Jesus is a human. He knew what was coming. And it stressed him out. And where's his first step? His first step is to the Father. His first step is to the person, the source. Like, I don't have faith to do this. The Father is the giver of faith. Not my will, but yours. See, we, we really like our wills. And when our wills um, get messed up, we all react differently. Isaac trembled. He had that sinking feeling. He realized what he had done. When my will gets messed up, I just, I just kind of shut down. <laughs> I get super quiet and I shut people off. When I, when I realize that I'm not God and that I can't control everything and, and, and plans that I have don't come to fruition, I shut down. Isaac trembled. I don't know what you do. We all do different things. Maybe we just push it down and put on a happy face. Maybe we run to a substance. Maybe we run to like fill in the blank. But that first step, nothing inside of us wants that to be the Father. And yet Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. When we realize that we aren't sovereign, that we're not God. And so uh, as the band comes up, we're going to close. And I just wanted to say, it, it's, here's the deal. It, it, it doesn't usually take a lot of faith. It doesn't usually take a lot of faith to live out your plans. But to walk with faith, to walk with God into like what he has put in front of you, into that difficulty, that thing that you didn't expect, that takes faith. That takes faith. So number one, our plans can get ruined. God's plans are unchallenged. He is totally in control. Number three, in Christ, we, we can experience undeserved blessing even in the midst of our plans being ruined by stepping first to the person, first to Jesus, first to the source of strength, to the source of faith. A lot of times that we, we think that the gospel is just this story of like how Jesus saved us, and that's it. And it is that. It is a story of how Jesus saved us. But it's not just a story. The gospel in itself is not just how Christ, Christ saved us, but it's how he sustains us. It's not a one-time, make your decision, you're good. We, we, we go there first, and then we keep going back. Our first step is to the Father. Our first step is to the gospel, because that's the source. On our own, we don't have the power to overcome what life throws at us. We don't have the faith. We don't have the strength. We like our own plans. But God is a God who gives undeserved blessing to people who don't deserve it. So let's not be people who take our first step elsewhere when life throws us something difficult. Let's step to Christ because he's our source. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you that your plans are not dependent on our obedience because a lot of times we struggle. But Lord, your, your plans are going to be executed to perfection and you choose to use us. Lord, our, our plans can be messed up. We can do it ourselves. Life can do it to us. But Lord, whatever the situation, help us to be people who go first to you, first to the source not just for salvation, but to be sustained. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to have a little bit of time right now, a response time. Um, we're going to have prayer partners up front. Um, and so spend some time with God. Spend some time with God, and then Mitch is going to come, um, and he'll close us out. 
And so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys all a benediction and send you on your way. Um, if you would, receive this benediction. The God of all comfort comforts us in our afflictions. May he comfort you in your afflictions so that you may be a comfort to those in their affliction. May you go in peace. We love you all. Thank you so much.